uh, transitional justice on a Monday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and our guest today is Manuel Felipe Mora Perez, and he is going to talk to us about um, about Colombia and about transitional justice in Colombia and about truth commissions as opposed to um, commissions that punish people. It's different, yeah. And, um, and of course, we want to know about democracy in Colombia. So welcome to the show, Manuel. Thank you very much, Jay. I'm very happy to be here, very grateful as well. So it's, it's an honor for me to be here today. Why are you here and not in Bo Bogota? Oh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a long story. I, I went to the French school in uh, Colombia. So I did like uh, a school traditional school trajectory, French school trajectory. Um, then when I was, when I finished the high school, I decided to stay in Colombia for a year. But then after that year, I decided to, came to, to, to come here to France. And I'm in Lyon. It's been uh, five years now since I'm in Lyon uh, studying law. Yeah. So I guess, I guess you're studying law in, in French. In French, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The civil code. The civil code, the, the famous civil code, the Napoleon code, as they, as some people call it here. So yeah, it's like very traditional, formal French law. Is that the same, the same as in Colombia? It's pretty much the same. At least uh, the French civil code is the foundation of most civil codes in South America, uh, and uh, particularly in Colombia, there's 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 been a lot of. If, French law influence in the legal system. Ah, okay. Yeah, I went to I went to court in Paris one time, and I, I found it so different from the American style. What happened in the courtroom? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in in uh, in in the U.S., it's uh, the legal system. It's common law. Um, here in France, is continental law, as they call it, but we call it other ways. But yeah, it's it's very different. Yet uh, there, there's also some similarities to it. So it's very interesting to study both systems. So you're in Europe, and that's so interesting to be in Europe now because uh, there's you know, so much speculation about which way Europe will go, which way NATO and the EU, and for that matter, France will go. And, and uh, who knows, but the, um, the election, which is happening now in stages uh, between Macron and uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, will determine whether France is uh, on the Ukrainian side of things, on the NATO side of things, on the EU side of things, or not. Um, th and this could have a huge effect on the way France goes and the way Europe goes going forward on the Ukraine phenomenon, don't you think? Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, France is like, with Germany, they are like the two uh, leaders uh, in Europe, in the European Union. And uh, the actual president Emmanuel Macron, he's been very, like, uh, supportive of the Euro of the European Union and what's been done, and very supportive of the uh, common response to the crisis in Ukraine. So it's very interesting to see uh, that uh, today the election thing and like everything coming up together to this crucial moment in history in France, it is indeed very interesting to see what's going to happen, as you say. If Marine Le Pen wins, well, uh, that kind of things like the European Union, the international community, French participation in the international community can be like um, the uh, subject to debate. If Macron wins, of course, there's continuity, but you know, it, it's very, it's very debateful right now in France about it and in Europe as well, but also in the world because you know France is one of these powerful countries who leads somehow the international community and the European Union. So it's very interesting. Yes, very interesting. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say it's scary um, because, uh, it, I mean, it's scary that Marine Le Pen could win, but it's also scary for, hmm, what do you call it, French democracy. And it's this, and I wonder what, what people, you must talk to people in Lyon, is that where you are? Uh, yes. You must talk to them and how do they feel when they tell you they're supporting uh, Marine Le Pen, what, do, do you ask them why? And, and what do they say when you ask them that? Well, you know, I, I don't used to um, like to hang out with people that support um, Marine Le Pen because uh, the, the people that vote Marine Le Pen are 
people that are usually quite old or that don't live in the big cities. But you can find also people that live in the big cities, but like they are very rich, they are very French, like traditional French families that go back to the very root of Frenchness, if I may say so. So I really haven't um, debated on Marine Le Pen winning. Of course, I've talked to my French friends and my French professors and, you know, the people I, I, I used to hang out with. And it's very interesting to see that for some people, Marine Le Pen, like they know she represents uh, this nationalist uh, rise in France, but she also represents like the change of uh, France being what in French is called terre d'accueil, which is the country that receives everyone somehow. And that's one of the main like top and key issues about her campaign, the immigration. So me, myself as an immigrant, of course, I wouldn't want her to win. And when I talk to my fellow immigrants, like the people I work with, the people I've been here uh, with in France for the last five years, it's very scary to think about Marine Le Pen uh, winning because, you know, it like she's not into into immigrants. And that's uh, that's a fear we have. And for the French people, it's also a fear, but, you know, they are... The nationalist movement is having lots of support. Uh, is having lots of support in the last few days, the last few weeks, the last few years. So yeah, as you say, it's scary. We'll see what happens. Um, and uh, well, that's about it. You know, it's it's a crucial yeah. moment in France, actually, when you look at it. Well, it reflects a, a trend, uh, if you will, a, a growing trend to the right, uh, not only in France but other countries in Western Europe, and that will ultimately affect. Uh, the solidarity of the coalition um, to help uh, Ukraine. So I, I worry about that on a larger scale because if Ukraine fails, if it's abandoned by Western Europe, we have a whole different issue and uh, phenomenon that that will that will be, that will <clears throat> have an effect on the world. My view. Yeah, no, you're right. It's it's very it's an important moment right now, crucial moment. We, I mean, we're living history right now. We're actually being in history right now at the moment, and especially here in Europe. Not only France, you know, but also Germany, Spain, Italy, other countries, and the NATO allies, of course. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to check back with you with another show, and oh, see yeah. and see how all this moves. So uh, re returning, to, returning to Colombia, you know, Colombia is a really interesting place because Colombia has at least the, um, you know, the start, the possibility, um, the um, emergence of uh, one of the more successful democracies, perhaps the most successful democracy in Latin America, uh, or at least south of Mexico. I'm not sure how successful you would say Mexico, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's at least south of Mexico, it's clearly a winner. Um, the FARC agreement, uh, God should make that one stay together. Um, and, um, you know, the development, we talked to uh, Juan Pablo, uh, do you know him, Juan, Juan Pablo Tello? Uh, he's a lawyer practicing in Bogota. And he tells us he's working on infrastructure uh, in the sense that infrastructure, he believes, can help the government reach all the rural areas in Colombia and thus bring security and prosperity uh, to every corner of Colombia, and that would help democracy. Um, but you know, the the title of our show is about truth commissions, and I and I wonder where that comes into play in this development of democracy in Colombia. Do do does Colombia need a truth commission? What's that all about? Okay, so you know. Um... Democracy, when you think of democracy, you can think of many things. And one of the main things about democracy is participation. And uh, participation is very important in all democratic processes, but especially in Colombia, because it's a country that, although has had um, like some interesting developments in the democratic system, still has lots and lots to do as to the participation and the guarantees of participation, political participation in Colombia. Um, as you say, when you when when you tell me about infrastructure and like um, getting to the far and isolated regions in Colombia, of course, there's also here like a democratic concern about it, especially after the armed conflict. 
So the Truth Commission is like a transitional institution, a transitional mechanism that is that was created uh, with the peace accords in 2016. And the mandate of the commission is to like conduct a very thorough study and report on the armed conflict, on what happened, why it happened, who were the actors, what were the consequences of uh, the participation in the conflict, and it's centered in the victims. So in my opinion, it is a, an institution that is very, very um, important and very useful for the development of democracy and the peace building process in Colombia. Explain that to me in, in, in terms of this, you know, the, the sociology of it and the politics of it. Why is it important? So it is important because the armed conflict in Colombia, you know, for, for those who, who don't have like particular background in this, it's, it's a very, very long conflict, more than 50 years of armed conflict and hostilities. Uh, 50 years where not only uh, state armed force were opposed to rebel armed force, but you know, there's been also like lots of participants that we didn't know of until today and the works of the commission. So that's one reason uh, why it is important because, uh, because of, of the mandate it has the commission to really produce and inform and a total report on what happened during the conflict and like to satisfy the right to truth. That's why is it called a truth commission. So by the end of, of the commission's mandate and work, the idea is to produce a final report. That's uh, what it's called. And this final report will contain all the information about the conflict and about what really happened during the conflict. Of course, it has dif different approaches, differential approach, gender approach. So you really get uh, to have a profound insight on what happened in the, in the conflict. And it's meant to help society uh, bring about reconciliation, knowing what happened, facing perpetrators, facing victims, and you know, like uh, starting to construct historical memory in order to to the peace building process and the implementation of the peace accords. I have so many questions for you, Manuel. Oh, um, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> so, um, what is the truth? I think you alluded to, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out why people were at war with each other. Um, is that what it is and why they, um, why they committed, um, you know, these, what do you call it, crimes against the people, atrocities against the people? What motivated them to do that? What did they, I guess, so they were very angry as a group. Why were they angry? I mean, I suppose this is what the commission would look into. What, what, how did the society break down to the point that people were killing each other? And, and you know engaging in atrocities, but but gee whiz, it's been five years. Um, why why has this taken so long? And my my third question, which I'll get I'll get to other questions in a minute, but my third question is, uh, assuming that soon enough, you know, this commission comes out with the quote truth end quote. It sounds like our select commission on the insurrection here in the U.S. You know. Um, assuming it gets to a final report, what, is, what does that mean? Is that the end of it? Uh, is that reconciliation? Is it forgiveness? Um, can you say that this would bring things to a closure? And how would that work? Okay, so you have to keep in mind that the Truth Commission in Colombia, but I think uh, most of the truth commissions in the world are embedded in uh, what's called a, a transitional justice system, which of course, um, the idea of transitional justice and transitional uh, institutions is to help society uh, transit from a period of atrocity and crimes and instability to a period of peace and stability. When I say peace, it's not like the peace all, all around the place, but, you know, stability at least. Um, so the Truth Commission, uh, as you say, is looking into what happened, is looking into um, who did the things that happened. 
um, is looking into who were the actors, what were the reasons, what were the uh, consequences, both in uh, terms of individual uh, responsibility or individual like experience, also collective experience and institutional experience. And coming to your question about the truth, so truth is a very uh, complex uh, notion and concept. What I mean by truth and what the commission uh, means by truth is to have, like to conduct a historic, historic um, radiography, if I may say, about the conflict and, and, and that's about it. So the right to truth is like what happened in Colombia, what happened to the victims that we don't know about, but maybe the perpetrators do know about and uh, facing what happened. Um, and well, what about uh, just a, a small point on that? You know, Colombia is, is, is famous for drugs and cartels yeah. and yeah. dangerous drugs and cartels uh, that, you know, that protected their business with every manner of crime. Um, so is that part of the mandate of the Truth Commission um, to find out about these cartels? And, and to the extent the cartels are still in business, and I, I surmise that at least some of them still are, uh, how, do you, how do you get information about a cartel that's still in business? I mean, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, some of the past uh, aspects of the drug war, as we call it, are indeed part of the transitional justice system, but not as a whole. Uh, because the transitional justice system in Colombia, it's most, well, it's, you know, it, it's about the, the, the peace agreements and the end of war between uh, the ancient guerrillas, FARC, and the government of Colombia. But of course, you know, it's, it's, it's very complex, the armed conflict in Colombia, as I was telling you. So, of course, there is the drug problem. Uh, indeed, it's one of the key aspects of the peace accords as well, like conduct like comprehensive uh, rural reforms and uh, in order to bring about solutions to this problem. Um, the commission in its mandate, of course, includes the drug problem. And what the commission do is like she, she collects, it collects uh, evidence from what happened uh, audiences, uh, testimonial, and, uh, and other aspects of evidentiary aspects, and tries to construct what happened, to reconstruct history as it happened, or at least as we thought it happened. And the, the problem about the actual cartels is it's very difficult because they are not part of the peace agreements, they are not part of the transitional justice system. So I wouldn't say the commission has a mandate to uh, like to collect information about that, but rather it's just like another issue uh, that falls upon the scope of the of the government, you know, ordinary mm. just. But who, who is it for? In other words, someday, you know, hopefully soon, but whenever it happens, there'll be a final report. I imagine there have been there have been partial reports up to this point, too. Who 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 is the the audience here? Who is the recipient? Who will sit and read it? Who will sit and be affected by it? Who will be curious about what's inside the cover? Will it be the government? Will it be business? Will it be the press? You know, the uh, the privileged, the few, or will it be the unprivileged, many? Who is it directed to? Well, hopefully, uh, everybody will be concerned uh, in the final report. That's what uh, I think. That's what the final report is is meant to be like. This, uh, this tool to everybody, to each and everyone, to each Colombian and to the society as a whole, of course, also to the institutions. There have been uh, like preliminary reports, lots of activities, you know, I was an intern for a month in the, in the Truth Commission in Colombia a few years ago, it was in 2019, I think. And it's very interesting the work they do, of course, it takes lots, lots of time that's what people and society must understand that transitional justice is not a thing that, you know, you cannot uh, bring about the solutions in a month or two, but it takes sometimes several years. So the final report is meant to be um, published this year by July, I think, or J June or July. Well, that's right and, around the corner, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when you think about it, you, you really, you actually don't know if, if, if the date is going to be respected, but it's not because the commission 
uh, is not doing the, the work it's meant to do, but it's because you know it's very difficult to produce such a such a final report. And the final report will of course also be like uh, directed to, and the recipient will be also the government institutions, and. Um, what they will do is that they will include like a full list of recommendation, recommendations to see what can be improved, what changes could be done to bring about uh, better, yeah, like better institutional and the, the contribute to the peace building pro uh, process. No, oh, that's very interesting. So maybe there'll be reforms in the report. I mean, suggestions or reforms and should organize the government um, you know, in a different way, should give people more human rights, more rights of representation. Uh, I suppose uh, you, know, you can have constitutional changes that flow out of a report like this. If they wanna come up with things that will improve the country and minimize the risk that this will happen again, uh, then they would, they would look to restructuring everything, no? Yeah, that's that's what we're hoping for. That's I think that that would be like the greatest achievement of the commission. Not only um, being uh, being like the 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 institution that I don't want to say tells the truth, but I mean the institution that actually looked into history and looked into what happened, but also the institution that because of what happened and because of the findings thereof uh, can recommend proper proper uh, changes in the institutional. Well, I would, I would guess, Manuel, that the, the government, at least uh, in what, 2016, when it began, uh, had a lot to do with organizing this truth commission. I mean, it couldn't, it couldn't really start without the blessing of the government, I think. And so I, I have a couple of questions for you on that. A, why didn't the government do this? Just do it, just do it. Assign the, um, the Colombian version of the FBI with the Department of Justice in the US and start an investigation. Um, why didn't they do it? Uh, they, I guess they wanted to stand aside for some reason. They wanted to let some third party commission do it instead. What was the reason for separating the commission and those in the government who were responsible for enforcing the law? So, you know, um... Lots of uh, investigations about what happened during the armed conflict are linked to public authorities and public officials, uh, government officials, but also the military. So um, the idea to have this third party commission or this independent commission was to really uh, gain independence and impartiality. So that- Was there a concern the government would be corrupt about it? It's a, it was a concern and it still is, is a concern and that's why there is uh, the Truth Commission that is it's separate from both the, uh, the former armed groups and like non-state actors and the state itself. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's like the, um, the interest of the commission being independent. And of course, that's why the government didn't, like you say, just like just uh, commission the commission to do mm. that sort of thing because you have to remember that the commission came out of the peace accords between the, the former foreign oh, okay so yeah. it was really like something that was negotiated that both parties conclude to be the best way um, uh, okay. for building so um you know the other thing is that in in the final report there may be some um you know accusatory findings and let's say for example that uh, john smith um uh, was engaged in atrocities and he organized the murder of many people and we didn't know that before uh, the truth commission found that out and now reports that to us does this mean that he is exculpated pardoned forgiven uh, or does it mean that somebody is going to actually go out and prosecute him now that we know he did that? So you have to know that the Truth Commission is one of the transitional institutions and mechanism of the transitional justice system in Colombia. Um, the commission goes along the um, the JEP is the, um, like the special jurisdiction for peace. It's like a specialty court. Uh, that actually inflicts, uh, well, that actually uh, punishes uh, mass atrocities and uh, 
you know, like really prosecutes the people that were involved in atrocity crimes during the armed conflict. So the final report of the commission and the findings thereof uh, are meant to contribute to the historical endeavor of, uh, of what happened during the conflict. Of course, the, the people concerned by atrocity crimes that uh, are potentially perpetrators or alleged perpetrators or confess perpetrators because the Truth Commission is also about telling the truth about what happened, what you did, if you are a victim or you are a perpetrator. Uh, the findings that are that fall under the scope of the special court, the, the special jurisdiction for peace, will have to be transferred to this uh, to this court in order to be uh, prosecuted and judged. Oh, so, so there might there might be prosecutions then afterwards, yes. and yes, these will be prosecutions in in courts that are organized in uh, Colombia. Not yes. international, but in Colombia. Of course, of course, but not because not because of the commission and the findings thereof, but because there is a specialty court provided for that, that it was provided for in the peace accords as well. So they do like different jobs. You know, mandate is very different, but they are somehow interconnected and intertwined between them. Those courts haven't started yet, though. They're waiting on the report. No, no, no. They do. They do. The the the, the specialty court, the, uh, the special jurisdiction for peace. It's been uh, it's been uh, it's been ongoing for about two or three years, I think. And they last year they started to um, to charge the the former um, non-state actors with uh, mass atrocities, so crimes against humanity and war crimes, because they apply um, provisions from the Rome Statute. So they are working, but it also takes takes a lot of time. So, Manuel, you know, is this, do you think, I mean, this is a really interesting part of the FARC agreement, uh, creating the Truth Commission, creating these specialty courts, uh, trying to find a path for reconciliation and justice in the country. Is it working? Um, do you think it will work going forward? Does it Does it need to be tuned up? Does it need to be changed or extended or revised in some way. Uh, so is, is it doing what it was supposed to do? It is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, I think, however, that it needs to be tuned up, you know, because the actual government uh, is not very, you know, they were very critical about the peace, the peace accords, the peace agreements, and they are very critical of the transitional justice system. They have allowed the work to be executed, but you know they are very critical of it. So that caused that in the last um, in the last few years, you know, many people say that the transitional justice system isn't working, it's not doing their work, it's taking too much time. But I think I think one has to understand that it takes time. It takes a lot of time to do to do so. But you know, it's going to be for me, the greatest achievement in, in institutional history in Colombia, because it is very well thought, it is very well executed. And you know me, I, I, I'm, I'm a fun uh, peace lover, and I, I, <laughs> I, I fully support the transitional justice system. Lots of difficulties, lots of things to do to improve, but you know, it's, it's going well, and I think it's going, it has a lot, lot of potential. So will you go back after school? Will you go back and participate in the process? That's one of the things that interests me the most. Yes, of course, to be able to go back to Colombia and participate in this peace building process. Um, of course, uh, I'm also like looking to other opportunities. And what I'm trying to do is like uh, gaining the relevant experience, professional experience. And if I ever go back to Colombia, like being able to really contribute to this peace building process in a concrete and a, and a proper way. Well, you see yourself as an international lawyer, and that isn't necessarily synonymous with going back to participate in a national um, initiative, because the, the FARC and the reconciliation process is a national initiative, not an international one. Um, so I, 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 I sense that uh, there's a lot there's a lot of other things you can and maybe will do in international law, but uh, with due regard for the fact that you are uh, familiar with the reconciliation process in Bogota, in Colombia. And, oh, yes, and, of course. And I guess my question to you is, is, is what is happening there in this process useful in other countries, in Latin America, 
in Africa, in other places in the developing world? Do you think you might be involved in setting up similar reconciliation processes in, in those places too? I think I think yes. Of course, it's it's like you know the Colombian peace process is it's a peace process, and the transitional justice system is something that, like 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 I said before, it's very well done and is being well executed. Well, at least like how it is how it is provided. So I think yes, it's going to be a good example for many other countries that are facing uh, armed conflicts or systematic atrocities. Like you know, it's like a like a useful foundation and framework that can be provided uh, from the Colombian experience, and of course, international law brings lots of tools to this kind of process, um, lots of um, framework, of course, as well. So uh, yeah, definitely, I think the Colombian the Colombian example will be helpful to many many other countries in Africa or also in the region. So when you look around in your classes in school in Lyon. Um, are there more like you? Are there more people who are studying international law so they can have a, a positive effect in terms of developing, you know, societies that are peaceful in places that have not been peaceful? You know, I think I think when you do international law, um, you are faced with disciplines that that are meant to bring solutions to uh, atrocity situations and atrocious contexts. So of course, I, 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 you know, I, I deal with with uh, my my fellow colleagues in uh, either in in PEJ because I'm I'm an intern at, at PEJ, but also like in the university and and in college. Of course, everyone has this peaceful vocation, if I may say, and everyone wants to help to contribute either nationally or internationally. But you know, the the, the main goal is to achieve some kind of stability, global stability, and of course national stability, you know, for me, uh, I never forget my country and I, you know, I'm very interested in contributing afterwards to, to the yeah. peace building process. But right now, you know, I, I ask everybody from PEJ, Project Expedite Justice, I ask everybody, is a, do you see, <clears throat> do you see um, uh, a trend here in atrocities and war crimes around the world? Uh, is it, is that phenomenon decreasing or increasing? Uh, and I, a lot of people say, no, it's increasing. Indeed, if you look at what's happening in Ukraine and uh, Vladimir Putin, it certainly seems to be increasing. And he is he's so far completely impugned from any accountability for the ongoing murder, the genocide, if you will, uh, of so many people in Ukraine. It's really remarkable uh, that this keeps on going in the world. Everyone in the world knows about it, and yet he keeps doing it. And, and then you have an, like an article in the New York Times the other day, and what it says is historically, um, leaders, autocratic leaders, tyrants, uh, who have engaged in war crimes and atrocities are, are, are not accountable for as long as they remain the leader. It's an interesting formula. If you remain the leader, you, don't, you wind up not being accountable. You only get to be accountable. It's a sort of an inverse comparison, an inverse relationship. Um, if, you, if you're not the leader, if you're somehow deposed or ousted as the leader, then you'll be prosecuted. Um, any thoughts about that? And uh, do you feel that we have more war crimes these days or less war crimes? I mean, I, I think you picked the right, I think you picked the right avocation manual. There'll be plenty of work for you going forward. Yeah? Um, I think, yeah, indeed, it's, it's a phenomenon that's increasing. I mean, with what happened in Ukraine, it was like a before and an after in international law, and especially in the human rights uh, international law and, 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 and that fields of, of international law. Um, it is, as you say, something um, that, you know, it's, it's very like there's work to do it's also very meaningful work but it's also very hard you know being confronted to to these kinds of atrocities and uh like having the obligations to bring about solutions uh to this kind of context very very difficult context but you know it's it's very meaningful and i mean i'm, I'm proud i'm proud of it i'm proud of what i do i try always to stay humble and like keep keep up with the good work and uh, bring thoughtful solutions and thoughtful 
um, yeah, like to apply my skills to their to their better. That's so, Manuel, you know, there are those people, including um, people that we have had on this show in one capacity or another, uh, who feel very optimistic about you and your generation, you and your orientation, and that there is a new there's a new group, a new generation coming up who is familiar with these issues and dedicated uh, to the notion of, of trying to do reconciliation, trying to create democracy, uh, trying to perpetuate human rights everywhere. Um, and, you know, I, I meet a lot of people just like you who are, you know, admirable in the sense that they, they have committed so far in their young lives, they have committed to do this and they, and they will do it for, you know, their entire life. But do you see that too? Do you feel that there's a generation coming up that will ultimately prevail against the autocrats, against the monsters, against the war criminals? Um, the, you know, do you feel that there's a lot of you out there? Do you feel that there's a generation that will have an effect on this? Are oh, you optimistic? Yes, sure. yes, yes, for sure. Well, at least I, I, I most certainly do hope so that uh, young people like me but not only lawyers, you know, that many other disciplines will be able to contribute to, to making the world better and to fight uh, authoritarian regimes and uh, being able to uh, bring visibility to atrocity and war crimes and well, everything that you say. Uh, I am confident. I also think that uh, work needs to be done. Like many young people are also losing interest to it because as you were saying before, you get lots of, of people, lots of authorities that have been like in the hurricane of atrocity, but still work every day, like nothing happened, are free of any charge. So it can be very frustrating, uh, especially international law, because, you know, international law, they say that it's very concrete, but at the same time, at the same time, it's very abstract. So you need to have like a particular mindset. Um, and willingness to 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 do to do good and to do great. Good for you. Do you see a place for yourself or others, your classmates, your colleagues uh, in Ukraine to rebuild Ukraine to to do? Uh, I, I guess I would call it a truth commission. Or there's a lot of truth to be discovered there. No kidding. Um, do you see Do you see the possibility of that? I, I do see the possibility, you know, it's it's been uh, it's already been discussed, like uh, the, the proper response to the Ukrainian crisis and to to the Russian aggression. Uh, I think it, it may take some time uh, because you don't know what's really happening in Russia. You know, it's been very hermetic, um, but you have uh, the Western countries, NATO, the European Union, the United States and uh, that are working on it, like how to come up with solutions and everything. Of course, I believe in the reconstruction of Ukraine. I mean, it would be, it would be a shame not to do it. It would be, you know, it, it's what needs to be done. And solutions will be, will be brought to light, hopefully soon. Uh, but yeah, for sure, for sure, that's, it's going to be something to, to look at uh, later on. Thank you, Manuel. Manuel Philippe Mora Perez. Uh, a, a master's student in international law in Lyon, France, and associated with the project Expedite Justice. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for answering my questions and engaging in this important conversation. My uh, pleasure, Jay. As we say, uh, au revoir. <laughs> au revoir. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a pleasure being here with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> the same. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo.
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.